right. So I think we are now recording. And uh, I wanted to open up by just once again, um, reading from uh, 2 Timothy. Um, we, uh, he says um, to Timothy, his, you know, his protege, and trying to figure out how to deal with all of the, the sort of stuff of life. He says, um, uh, he says this to, to Timothy. He says, um, he says don't uh, forget. He says, but as for you, continue what you have learned to become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So now that we've, um, one of the things we want to do is, uh, is to kind of think about, I think the first starting point is to understand why we, uh, why we read the scriptures. And one of the temptations I think is, is for us to just know more about the Bible. And the truth is, I'm, that's not our intent. My intent is not so that you know more about the Bible. It's so that you can do all of those things so that, so that life is, you know, so that we figure out how to live life in a way that's good, in a way that is uh, life-giving and, and, you know, uh, in a way that, you know, ultimately makes us happy. Now, I mean, remember happiness is, if we, if we focus on happiness, you know, we tend to not be happy. Uh, but if we focus on living for the Lord, happiness comes with it. And, and so part of this is just learning how to read the scriptures uh, in a way that that helps us, you know, make sense of the world around us. So uh, let's see. Here we go. So what we want to do is um, is at this point uh, is to talk about the big picture of the Bible. I've used this analogy before. When I first moved to California, I was um, uh, driving. Uh, I went to Pasadena, and and then I was trying to get back here to La Crescenta, and I really hadn't, and I get lost, even now I get lost when I go to Pasadena for some reason. I can't seem to find my way around. But when I was coming back on the freeway, I knew that Pasadena is east of, uh, of La Crescenta, right? I knew that because I got on, you know, going east to get there. Uh, so when I was trying to come back out of, to get back on the freeway, there was two signs and they said, one said, San Bernardino this way, San Fernando this way. And it didn't say east or west, which I thought was just the strangest thing in the whole, you know, crazy. And, and so I didn't know which way to go. So I just picked one. And of course, I ended up like going towards San Bernardino. And I realized, you know, quickly that I had to get off and get back on. But that's the problem. The problem was, is I didn't know the geography. I didn't know that San Bernardino was east of Pasadena. I had no clue. It was just there were two sands and I didn't know which one was which. And because I just moved here. And I think that's one of the times the problems we have with the Bible is that when we get into the Bible, when you start reading the Bible, we have absolutely no idea where we are. We don't know which way is east and west and north and south. And so having a big picture of the Bible is a really, really important thing so that you can kind of when you jump in, so let's, let's say that you're going through a Bible study in the book of Romans or you're in First Samuel or whatever book you were in it's important to know where you are in the journey so that you kind of have a sense of, you know, the exits, the, you know, where to, where, where the good, you know, uh, rest stops as it were, right. There's places where you're going to stop and look. And, and so knowing that big geography is really, really important. So um, I did, uh, I hit mute uh, on everyone. So if you want to unmute yourself to ask a question or whatever, there's a thing where you can even raise your hand or whatever. You don't have to do that. Just unmute and 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 ask. Uh, stop me at any time if anything I say either sparks a question or just you know is unclear. Uh, feel free to stop me whenever you need to. All right. So um, the big picture of the Bible. I do want to give a uh, sort of a um, a sort of shout out to. And it's backwards. I'm sorry. I don't know how to make it not backwards. I'm sure there's a way to do it, but I don't know how to do it. But this is a book called The Epic yeah. of Eden. By Actually, it's Sandra frontwards Richter. to us. Oh, is it? Oh, good. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. It, it, you're backwards to your own self 
because it's mirroring on your screen. Good. Oh, that's good. I'm glad you guys can read this. This is uh, The Epic of Eden by Sandra Richter. In fact, I'll type that in the uh, comments if you want to do that. Uh, so here's the chat. And uh, she does a really great job of, uh, she, she does a really great job. And one of the things I like most is that she has, um, she kind of gives you the big picture. Oh, come on, where is it? I just flipped to it and then I lost it. Um, she does some really, she does uh, some big pictures, but she also has this really great, she actually does this several times. Let's see if I can get this to work. She has these nifty charts in the book. Now this is primarily an Old Testament uh, book. Uh, it is a, it's called a Christian entry into the Old Testament. But what she does well is she lets you see that the old that the store the big picture of the Bible is uh, she helps you see how to put all of that together and she does a great job. Uh, she teaches it at um, uh, she teaches at Wheaton or no. She teaches at West Westmont, so right over here in uh, I guess Santa Barbara is where Westmont is, but. Um, so she teaches uh, and, and she's a great teacher and she's a great scholar. Uh, and so she's, that's a great book to help you. And I want to tell you this because I think this is really important. It is a, and it's a very, it may be even controversial, but honestly, I really do believe this, that the way to understand the Bible, the key to understanding the Bible is not to start in the gospel of Matthew or to start in John or something like that. That's very often where we get people to start. I, and when you're first learning the faith, that may be a great place to start. But when you want to learn to deepen your faith and study the Bible, the best place, the thing you really need to do is to understand the Old Testament. Because the New Testament is really just the Old Testament part two. Um, and I really, it's important that we get that, that the, old, that the New Testament is really just a, a um, not only is it space-wise so much shorter than the New Testament, it, but it's it like imagine um, it it the the New Testament is the fruit hanging on the tree of the Old Testament, right? So if the if you can picture an apple tree, the the tree part is the Old Testament, the fruit is the New Testament, and it's and it may, that may be a helpful analogy to let you see how that works. The New Testament is the is the fruit. That, that the Old Testament is bearing in the world uh, because the Old Testament gives us all of the structure. It gives us the thought world and the New Testament is the bearing of fruit. And you're gonna see how that works out in just a minute. So uh, the old let's look at the big story and I'll explain why that, I think that analogy will help you, the fruit on the tree of the Old Testament. I think that will help you see once you, once you see the big picture. So let's very simply, talk about the big picture. The big picture, remember, so if we're going to start with the Old Testament, um, we have five books of the, of the Old Testament, right? We call them, there are lots of things they're called. They're sometimes called the Torah, right? If you have a Hebrew Bible um, or, a, or a Jewish publication society, they, they also produce uh, an old, what we would call the Old Testament. But they have the first five books of the Bible. They're the Pentateuch, uh, penta me, you know, like five, like, you know, um, pentagram or pentagon or something like that. There are five of them, right? There's um, uh, five books of the old, of the, the, uh, the first five books of the Old Testament are the, called that. They're Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And they all essentially are attributed to Moses because they have Moses as the, one of the primary characters of all of those. Now, the story of the Pentateuch is, is actually fairly, it's not super difficult, right? So we, what do we start with? In Genesis, we start with creation, right? And in creation, we see God lovingly creating the world. Uh, and then we see Adam and Eve in the garden, and they are his, um, they are his, uh, the people that are supposed to tend the garden to continue God's creative work in the world. Now, the problem is, is that they choose rather than to be, to be obedient to God and rather than to be dependent upon God, they choose to try to be God, right? They try, try to replace God. Uh, and so they are expelled from the garden. And then everything goes down and down and down and down, right? We have those early stories of, of the Bible, right? Adam and Eve are expelled from the garden, expelled from life. And we, then we have, you know, the flood. We, well, we have the first murder, Cain kills Abel. 
right? We have, uh, we have, then we have the flood, <clears throat> then we have, you know, Noah, you know, we, we have those stories. Then we have the, you know, the, the um, Tower of Babel. It just, it just feels like everything gets worse and worse and worse until we get to Genesis chapter 12. And in Genesis chapter 12, we meet God's, um, now we're tempted, but let's, we meet God's rescue plan for the world. And God's rescue plan has to do with Abraham. Now, notice what I didn't say. It's not God's plan A, and then that doesn't work out, and then we have plan B. There's only one plan, and, it ha- and it, it, the, first, the plan centers on Abraham and his descendants. Now, we'll see how this works in a minute, but that is the plan, and God doesn't abandon that plan. That plan is always the plan. So remember, God chooses Abraham and says to Abraham, I'm, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to make you a great nation, and I'm going to bless the whole world through you. Right now, then Abraham, of course, Abraham's old. Uh, he doesn't, and, and his wife, Sarah, is old. They don't know how they're going to have children. They don't know how they're going to be turned into a great nation, but God does it. And then, so we follow that story. Then we have Abraham has Isaac, who has, you know, Jacob, who, you know, then, so it's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then Jacob has the 12 sons, right? And they all go down into Egypt. This is a story at the end of the book of Genesis um, about, you know, the Joseph narratives and the, and the amazing Technicolor dream coat, right? They go down into Egypt and they become enslaved there. The second book of the Bible is Exodus and Exodus means exit, right? The story of Exodus is God taking them after 400 years of slavery. So between Genesis and Exodus, you know, that, that there's no space in our Bibles, but there's 400 years between those two books. And the four, the, so then God brings Israel out of uh, Egypt, out of slavery, out of bondage, and gives them a home. Now, the problem is, is that the people of Israel uh, are nervous and, and, well, and rebellious. And they don't want, they, so when they go to the promised land, they won't go in. And so they end up having to wander the wilderness for 40 years, right? But during this time, because God has lovingly brought them up out of Egypt, he gives them his law and he makes a covenant with them, right? And a covenant is just another word for agreement. He gives them the covenant and he says, because I love you, this is what it means to live with me. uh, Because I'm going to be in your presence and you're going to be my people and I'm going to be your God. And, and, but in order to do that, you're going to, there's, I'm going to do some things and you have to do some things. There's a, there's an agreement. Now, once we have this covenant, we get that, that's essentially the first five books of the Bible. That, that just little narrative I told you is covers the first five books. Now you're saying, Lee, there's a lot more in there. Of course there is. But if you know that story, you can make sense of the first five books of the Bible. Right, so then we get to the next set of books of the Bible, and it's Joshua, and Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, right? Those are the next section, and they tell the story of how Israel goes into the land and possesses the land. Judges is the failure of the people, uh, and basically the book of Judges tells us that every, there was no king in Israel, and everybody did whatever they pleased. And it, it was a just a, a, a disaster. The book of Judges, when it first starts off, we see that it's a very similar to the United States when they had um, the Articles of Confederation. Remember, before, the, you know, from 1776 to 1789, the, they didn't have a constitution, or at least they didn't have the constitution we have today. And it was pretty much a kind of a failure, just like Israel was a failure. Right, they needed there. There needed to be some, you know, government in place, right? And so, uh, when we get to First Samuel, the book of First Samuel, the people finally are trying to get a king, and God finally relents and says, "That's fine." He gives them not. He gives them the first king, who's bad, who is Saul. Right, Saul is the first king, and for the most part, a dismal failure. But then, in the in the middle of First Kings, we get David. And David is the king of it. When you think of the kings of Israel, only one of them comes should come to mind, and it should be David. He was the the king that was chosen after God's own heart. And David was, even though David was certainly not perfect, uh, but David was he was a man who longed for God and who and who wanted to do what was right with God. 
And God makes a promise to David. He says, David, there will always be one of your descendants on the throne, always. Then David has, then David has, at the end of David's life, he has some really, uh, some, some moral failure, let's face it, and uh, uh, worthy of a, you know, of a Netflix series, right? And uh, he, he, he has a, an affair with Bathsheba and then murders her husband, Uriah the Hittite. And then, of course, they, their baby, their, their child dies as a result of their sin. And then, but eventually she has another child named Solomon. And Solomon becomes the next king of Israel. And under Solomon, Israel is the most, uh, Israel is the largest in size and the most economically and military, it's the, the most powerful Israel ever is. And it's under Solomon, they build the temple, right? It's these powerful things. But Solomon's heart is turned away from God. And after and Solomon begins to worship other gods. And because he does, God splits the kingdom. And so there's the northern kingdom of Israel, and there's the southern kingdom of Judah, right? And Judah is where Jerusalem is. The northern king, king, kingdom, after, so after Solomon, the, the kingdom is split into two. The northern kingdom has only bad kings. There's not one good king in the whole, northern of, Israel, uh, the whole of northern Israel, uh, Israel, and they are destroyed by the Assyrians in 722 B.C. In the southern kingdom, they have a few good kings, but not, not many, but a couple, uh, mostly bad. But, and so they are destroyed in 586. Now, the reason they are destroyed is because Israel refuses to keep the agreement. Remember, God made a covenant with Moses, an agreement with Moses, and, and the people said, yes, we'll do it. And of course, they didn't do it. Remember, Israel is the rescue uh, plan for the world. Is Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden. Adam, uh, Israel is the rescue plan, but Israel cannot accomplish the rescue plan. They can't be the rescue plan because they need rescuing as bad as the rest of the world. Now, remember, I told you, Israel is not plan A and God has to scrap plan A, right? That's not what happens. We'll see that in a second. So is the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom are destroyed and the people are sent into exile because they won't obey God. And so if you, here's where, if you were reading in the Bible, you'd be reading first and second Kings and you'd be reading the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, uh, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah. Lamentations is actually more like writings, but Ezekiel, Daniel, Amos, Joel, uh, all of those, those all fit into that. So if you're talking about geography, where are we on the three, on the 134 freeway of the Bible? We're in, we're in, we're now in the, the Kings and in the prophets. And then that once the people are sent into exile, they go into, uh, uh, to Assyria and to Babylon. God says, remember the promise that the prophets made was if you don't obey the Lord, he's going to send destruction. But even if he sends destruction, he will bring you back. One day, God's going to make a new covenant. Remember, Israel was always God's rescue plan for the world, always, and still is. He says, but one day, God is going to do, make a new covenant, right? This is not a plan B. It's a, a new, brand new covenant. He says, God's going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel, and God's going to send his spirit on you, and he's going to make make new things. He's going to do this new thing in which he's going to transform the human weakness that he sees in Israel so that one day, eventually, Israel is still going to be the rescue plan. And, and, and the people of Israel wonder how that's going to work out. We don't know how that's going to work out. Now, we get to the New Testament. And I know you're saying, Lee, you skipped a lot of stuff. And I have. But remember, what we're doing is providing the backbone the structure, and all of these other books fit into that structure somewhere. So remember that after the people of Israel go into exile, they actually do come back into the world. They come back into the land. And that's where you could read those stories in Ezra and Nehemiah uh, and even Esther and some of those places. That's where those would fit. They come back, but they're never, but the God hasn't done this new thing, right? They come back and there's, the, the city is never as quite as good as they thought it would be. There's, you know, it, God doesn't seem to have done all the things that he done, that he promised. And so they're waiting. They're waiting for God to keep his promises that he made. 
And here we come to the New Testament or what we call the New Testament. And here's where the fruit, remember, so if that story I just told you is the tree, remember God's rescue plan is the tree. When is God going to keep his promises? When will the tree bear fruit? When will the tree really be the rescue plan for the world? Aha, the New Testament is the fruit. The New Testament is God keeping all of those promises and, and keeping the fruit. And so what, is, what happens? Jesus comes on the scene, a son of David. Remember, it's in the Bible tells us clearly over and over and over again that Jesus is the son of David. Remember, God made a promise to David that there would always be a, one of his descendants on the throne. He is the son of David. Uh, he also, remember, he's going to, Nate and I were reading uh, in Mark about the Passover meal. And remember, God brought uh, Israel up out of Egypt. He made an, an exodus. And very, what the New Testament is going to do is going to use a lot of these allusions from the Old Testament and tell us that God is doing this new thing. Remember, it's not plan B. It is, a, it is the fulfillment of all the promises. He's going to do that in Jesus. And so Jesus comes in the scene. He begins to be this uh, Messiah figure. Remember, a Messiah is a person who's been anointed by God, like Saul, like David, like Solomon, a kingly figure. And he's going to be this Messiah, this Christ, that's the Greek version. And he comes and he, he does all of these things that a Messiah should do. Uh, but remember, what we, the prophets told us is that God is going to have to do something very profound. He's going to have to do something new in order to make Israel be the, the, the rescue people. And Jesus is going to die. He's going to be the sacrificial lamb. He's going to be the, the one who suffers for the people of Israel, and not just for the people of Israel, but the whole world. And in his resurrection, he defeats the power of sin, and he, the Holy Spirit comes. Remember, in the prophets said that in the, new, the last days, God was going to do something brand new. He was going to breathe his spirit on his people. And they would be able to do keep the law. They would their hearts would be changed. He wouldn't have to write a, a covenant on the tablets of stone, but he would write his covenant on our hearts. Right? That's what Jeremiah says, and that's what Ezekiel says. And Jesus finally does that. Jesus comes and he breaks the power of sin. He defeats death. And he and what and what the New Testament, the rest of the New Testament tells us is that God is, begins to write his uh, laws on our hearts. He begins to change human. Uh, not just human lives, but all of the world. He begins to do that. Then we get, to, so the gospels essentially tell us that story about how finally the fruit that is, that the, that the, you know, that the Old Testament provides, the tree, Jesus is the fruit. He is the, the fulfillment of all of those promises to Israel. Now, the book of Acts tells us what happens when the fruit, when the, when the new life that is in Jesus, when this new covenant that is in Jesus, what happens when that fruit hits the Roman world? How, how does that Jewish, remember the Old Testament story is the tree, the, the fruit is the New Testament. What happens when a non-Jewish world, i.e. the Roman world, what happens when this new life comes in contact with the Roman world? And that's exactly what the, what the book of Acts is about. It is about the early Christians taking this primarily Jewish message of God's redemption for the world and his rescue for the world, and he pulls it out, he pushes it out into the world, into the Roman world. Then you get into Paul, um, and, and essentially what, that's, you know, that takes us through the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that takes us through Acts. And then once we get into the letters, it is, we can the letters provide us like phone calls, right? Because we only hear one side of the story in the letters, right? It's like we're hearing one side. But the New Testament are essentially the letters that, that Paul, mostly Paul, wrote to the churches to help them deal, to help them learn how to be the people of the rescue people of God, right? The, the fruit of rescue is in the world. The, the letters are primarily sent to say, here's what it means to, to be God's rescue people in, in the world that you live in. And that could be said about all of Paul's letters. It could be said about all, you know, first and second Peter and Hebrews and all of those. And ultimately what we see, what we end with is the book of Revelation. And in the book of Revelation, it is a story of being able to see the world clearly and, and hope for the world. And what do we end with in the world? We end with 
uh, not Christians leaving this world and going off to live in heaven, but rather heaven, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven and being and, and God's dwelling coming back into with to dwell with human beings and and uh, God's presence once again, remember just like in the Old Testament, in Eden, right God walked and he lived with the humans at the end of the book of Revelation, uh, at the end of the Bible in the book of Revelation, God is once again, comes down from heaven and he is living with human beings once again. Uh, he wipes away every tear. He, there is no more death. There is no more destruction. Finally, human beings are, have been transformed and, and to live with God's presence. Now, that was a mouthful. And that took us about, I looked at the clock. It took us about 20 minutes to do that. But that is essentially the big picture. So that's all we're going to do today is we're going to talk about the big picture. Let me share one thing with you very quickly, and then I'll give you time. We have a few minutes to ask questions, and I do want to do that. <clears throat> but very quickly, let me give you one reset of resources uh, that are free. So I'm going to, let's do this. All right, if you look on your screen now, you'll see that there's a place uh, called biblicaltraining.org. And this is, uh, they're all, this is a free resource um, to you. Uh, and I mean, of course you can donate. I usually support them once a year. Uh, this was started by a guy named uh, Bill Mounts or William Mounts. Uh, and he is, he's the, the author of the most uh, used Greek um, grammar of any, like almost every seminarian, not every, but a lot of seminarians have used this Greek grammar that he wrote. Um, and he's a really good guy. And he just wanted to help people to learn how to read the scriptures better. Uh, and so if you go over here to the top, you follow my thing. There are these things, there are classes. He has three levels. There's foundation, academy, and institute. Uh, and so foundations would be kind of the very beginning. And if you click on that, there are a list of classes, right? And it comes down. And so it says um, he begins its discipleship. Here's um, the Bible survey, a big, big screen projection, you know, understanding the Old Testament. They're all of these, and they're basically like you can download them if you clicked on Understanding the Old Testament. Um, there are, a lot of times there are videos, right? Um, but they're also, you can download them and listen to them as podcasts. Um, and you can, and these are all free resources for you to use at any time. Uh, you do have to, you do have to have a, um, an account and you do log in, but it's free to do that. Um, there are a lot of other resources too, like I, I showed you the one that um, by Sandra Richter, there are others. Um, there, are, there are a lot of resources out there that you can really uh, connect with that can help you do um, just once you have this framework of the big story, uh, you can then uh, move into each one of these and begin to fill in the, the meat of the framework as I've, as I've sort of explained it. Now, um, you're all muted. But I will take, uh, the, and, but feel free, like if any of you have any questions or comments, or if I went fast and something seemed blurry, uh, just unmute yourself. Let me stop sharing here. Uh, just unmute yourself and feel free to ask a question or make a comment or whatever. Sorry, I talked a lot there and I promise this will be the last time I do that. You'll, on Wednesday, we're going to actually go through and do some of the detail stuff and there will be a lot more participation. So. Um, but any questions or comments or criticisms? I just see people shaking their heads. They're like, no, it's fine. All right. Well, um, this is by far, we're going to use this. Um, this I'm going to post this um, right now. I've, I, I promise I'm poor uh, 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 John. Um, Gray has been, he keeps having to remind me to post this. I'm going to do this right after this. So it'll go to Facebook and it will go to YouTube. Uh, and so you'll be able to go back and, you know, can share that with other people who may be struggling with the Bible. But I think once you see the big framework of the Bible, once you see how that works, then all of a sudden, when you're, when you get placed into those sections of the Bible, you go, oh yeah, that, that does make sense. I, I see where I am, you know, in the big story. Um, now that I know the whole geography of the land, I know that when I get to first Samuel, I know where I am kind of in the big story. I, I look at the big geography and I see it and it makes sense to me. Um, like I said, I skipped over, you know, I took, uh, that was basically the Bible in 20 minutes, which is, you know, clearly I, I skipped stuff. 
Uh, but, um, but you'll see that once you kind of understand that framework, everything else really falls into place uh, and it will help you. Now, that doesn't mean that all your questions are going to be answered because honestly, I go into the Bible and the more I go into the Bible, the more questions I have, but um, which is a good thing. It, 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 it makes us continue to read and to find out who God is. All right, well, it is, um, since we are done today, um, I'm not going to make you do endure any more of my talking, but uh, Wednesday when we come, we're, I don't have the book here, but we're going to be talking about like the details, and so we're going to do a lot more of the screen sharing, and I'm going to have um, some, we're going to be doing like where you actually go through and, and begin to notice things, and, and where I'm going to give you a, a way of kind of helping you to, to just read through the Bible uh, in, in a way that helps you see the because we've seen the big picture Wednesday we're going to kind of talk about the details like how do we read how do we go through the Bible and how do we read those things and uh, there will once again be more resources and we'll, we'll actually do some practice on the screen uh, and we may do that Thursday and then part I mean Wednesday and part of Friday and Friday we're going to talk about how do we incorporate the Bible into our prayer life uh, that will be I think kind of more where we think about using it devotionally as well as just reading it, you know, for understanding it. We'll talk about how to do that and apply it and those kinds of things. All right. Well, if there are no questions and you're all, you know, great students. Uh, so uh, we'll see you guys uh, Wednesday. We'll be back here. <clears throat> I'm actually getting here on Wednesday. I'll probably be here early. Uh, so if you want to stop in early and just say howdy, uh, Jeff and I were able to get here early. Uh, he just got logged in early and we were able to catch up a little bit. If you like to do that, I, I'm going to try to do that more uh, so that maybe there'll just be some time for us to catch up and, and be ready. All right. Well, I love you guys and I hope you have a great day. Uh, Janie, I hope you have a, a good drive, a safe drive. Uh, Jeff, tell Martha we miss her and that we hope she gets better soon. And uh, any of you, if you need us, just let us know. Thanks, Lee. All right. Thank you, guys. See you soon. It was great. Bye. Bye.